Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Deering, and I am the managing director of the um, Society to Preserve the Millvale Murals of Moxovanka. Um, I hope you're all hearing me right now. Um, the uh, great thing about being the first, uh, there's a good and bad about that. Um, you are experiencing our first table talk. So um, we are very excited to be experiencing this with you <laughs> for the first time, but welcome. Um, we're really excited to, um, number one, just to be beginning our first virtual program and uh, really to be starting um, this program with such an exciting um, introduction, which is the introduction to the Vanka collection. And um, we are able to be here tonight and making this introduction, uh, I want to say first and foremost, because of the generosity of the Vanka family. And I'm excited to tell you that um, Maria Halderman, Moxa Vanka's granddaughter, and his great grandson, Alex Halderman, are both um, on, part of the audience tonight. So uh, we're really excited that they're here. We're really extremely grateful for their generosity in, in making this gift and can't wait for you to get a sense of, of what we have here. Um, I also want to thank um, people who um, contributed, made donations as part of their viewing tonight. Uh, that's really um, was wonderful, um, helps to make our programming possible. So I just wanted to say a thank you to everyone for that. Um, I also wanted to thank our partner Sprezzatura for providing dinner uh, for, for guests here in Pittsburgh. So thanks, thanks for that. Um, we, um, I, and in just a minute, I am going to uh, get the show started, but I do want to uh, give you a few uh, hints about what's happening here and how you can participate. Uh, I also want to say that I know I have a number of experts in the audience, so always happy for any um, clues if you think we're, we're heading down the wrong direction here. But um, if you can see at the bottom of your screen, we have two ways for you to talk to us tonight. Um, we would like you to be using the Q&A at the bottom here, at the bottom of your screen. We'd like you to be using that to, um, as we go along in the presentation, you can type in a question and um, there we will, we will answer them as we go along if we can, or we will hold them for the Q&A session after Dr. Rohr's talk this evening. There's also um, a function in that, um, in the Q&A where you can, um, you can vote thumbs up on questions so we can upvote questions so they rise to the top and we're sure to, to be paying attention to those um, at the, at the Q&A. But um, so, so please keep a lookout for that because we want to um, be able to, to answer a lot of questions this evening. Uh, the chat function is available at the bottom of your screen. The chat right now is, uh, will go to, to me as the host, also to our other host, Rosalind Colgan, and to Sylvia, to Dr. Rohr. So we will see your chats, but right now you're just talking to the panelists. So um, hopefully that's, um, uh, you know, that'll work for all of us. But if you're having any problems, feel free, free to, to touch um, base with us. And um, so I, I'm really happy to tell you too that um, I am being um, assisted tonight, uh, working with um, as co-hosts, both of my uh, panelists, uh, Rosalind Colgan and Sylvia Rohr. And uh, Rosalind in just a minute is going to take over and um, get us started, get us started with the program. But um, right now we're expecting a total of about 100 people to join us for this program. And, and we're just really uh, excited about the response. And obviously we, we really credit that to the subject matter of, of tonight's presentation. So um, the hope is, is that I'm going to be making a smooth transition over to Rosalind now. And then um, we will move on to uh, Dr. Rohr. Thanks again for being here, and we hope uh, we'll see you again um, at another another presentation. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Rosalind Colgan. I am a local author here in Pittsburgh. I live in the Strip District uh, neighborhood of Pittsburgh, and I love the Vonka murals. 
So I thought we could start off with a poll. Um, again, you heard you are our um, guinea pigs. So we are going to try launching this poll. And it's just a quick uh, question of, have you seen the Vanka murals in person? Okay, it's working because I see people answering really quickly. I'll give you a few seconds to fill that out. All right, you all are fast. We've got 70 out of 74 participants in 24 seconds. That's really impressive. So uh, the results are that, yes, you have seen the Vanka murals in person. That is 74% of the group we have here and no is 26%. So I will share the results. I think you can share those, see those, I'll stop sharing. And um, so for me, the first time that I saw the Vanka murals was when I was researching for my book, which is called 100 Things to Do in Pittsburgh Before You Die. And the Vanka murals had always been on my bucket list. But I think, as many of you know, sometimes things sit on your bucket list until you're sort of compelled to do them, whether it's uh, because you're checking things off on a book or whether you're writing a book, in my case. Um, I'm not an artist or an art expert. I simply am an art lover, and I really love the Vanka murals. They completely blew me away the first time I visited. I think the themes in Vanka's work are as resonant today as they were when he first painted these pieces. And I find myself reflecting on those themes often, um, thinking about what's happening in our world today. So when friends or family visit Pittsburgh, I try to take them to the murals. Um, I think they are an absolute treasure. So um, I try to take all different ages, all different groups to the murals, most recently, um, I took a friend who is Jewish and his husband is a rabbi. So I thought it would be really interesting to hear his perspective on the murals. And he was as blown away as I was, which I think really speaks to how these pieces transcend um, religious affiliation and they speak to all of us. What, uh, what else I love about the murals is that they are, um, you know, they're not showy. You wouldn't necessarily expect that when you came inside this yellow brick church in Millville that you were going to be completely blown away by the artwork inside. Um, and I think that just speaks to how these things are just an absolute gem in Pittsburgh. And they tell uh, not only this story of, of Pittsburgh, but the story of the immigrant experience. And we are going to go ahead and get into those stories. We're joined tonight with Dr. Sylvia Rohr. She is the director and curator of the University Art Gallery at University of Pittsburgh. She's also a leading expert on um, American mural art history. So we are in for a treat. Um, as uh, Anna mentioned before, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the box and we will do our best to answer them. But in the meantime, without further ado, uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be your guest host. And Sylvia, take it away. Muted. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here today with everybody. I, um, I'm so happy, actually, in some ways, to be able to use Zoom. I prefer, of course, to be with you in person and in the church talking about the murals, but I think there are certain things about this medium that are really lovely. For example, that poll that we just did was spectacular for me to get an idea of how the entire audience either is familiar with the Vanka murals or has that to look forward to in the future when we start to open up again. Before I start taking you through some images, because um, of course I'm an art historian, so I have to start with images, I um, wanna give a few thanks, uh, words of thanks in particular to my co-hosts tonight, Rosalind, and especially Anna During, who is always keeping the Vanka murals in the public eye and working towards their ongoing preservation, as well as to the board of the Society for the Preservation of the Millville Murals of Paxo Vanka, it's a long phrase, um, again, for doing that hard work. I would also like to thank the entire St. Nick's community for um, being part of the story that Max Ovenka had to tell. Today I'll be using photographs from various photographers, so I do want to give a shout out to those photographers. Amy C. Fisher of Pawsburg Photography and David Newman of um, ARCA Fine Arts Services. So you'll see some of their handiwork in the lecture tonight. Sprezzatura, also I'd like to thank them for, be, for creating this table and meal for all of us during this evening. And of course, a very, very special thanks to Maria Halderman and the entire Vanka family. 
The generosity of the gift is opening a whole new era for the Van murals and for our understanding of this artist in this city in the 1930s. So I'm very grateful for their generous gift. And of course, I wanna thank you, everybody who's letting us into your home tonight and allowing us to have this table talk around all of these tables throughout the city and across the country. I, um, I'm gonna go off script a little bit so Anna and Rosalind might worry a little bit, but I want everybody to think about it. We have 75% of you who have seen the murals. I can see the chat here. If in the chat box you can think of the one word that came to mind or the two words that came to mind when you first saw the murals, please just send that in the chat so that I can get an idea of some of your initial impressions when you first saw those murals and I'll see them pop up to us. I see magnificent is one. So Sydney is actually dream state is another. Colorful, fascinated, moving, immersal, immersive, stunning, overwhelming, real life. I like that. Powerful. And I love the phrase, I can't believe this is in a church. I think a lot of us have felt that graphic, intense, arresting, astounding. I think being able to hear all of your feedback right now is another beautiful thing about this medium that we have right now. So on that note, I'm actually going to switch in. I see a lot of wows and moving God's presence in the lives of ordinary working class people. What you can tell from these few, these, these words of feedback is you can't go into the church and you can't confront the Max Ovanka murals without having a very powerful reaction. We've heard that from Rosalind and I want to share a little bit about my own story of how I've been working with the murals and my first impressions. So I'm going to move on now to our talk for today. Let me see. What you are looking at on the screen is the cover of a sketchbook, a lie right drawing tablet. They were on sale in the 1930s in the United States. A lot of you probably don't recognize them. The company has gone out of business. And when I first saw this, I was very surprised. I was shown this in what seems like another time ago, another world ago, in January 2020 by Anna During. She had just recently received the gift from the Halderman family. And she was sharing these drawings with me and the sketchbooks with me. This is the cover of Max Ovenka's sketchbook from 1935 and 1937. I held this in my hand and started to leaf through the pages to see the sketches that showed how he was planning out the church murals, the individual people. Alongside the pages of this very humble sketchbook were also drawings that the family donated, drawings of places that are very familiar the Cathedral of Learning, the Bridges of Pittsburgh. I was in awe. I hadn't felt that awestruck since I first saw the murals. Anna and I, both in that moment, had a sort of epiphany of re-meeting Max Ovenka for the first time after having been so familiar with the murals. I saw these drawings as a way to get deeper into my understanding of this artist, of his process, and as you can see from these two drawings, a very different working styles from preparatory to the finished murals we know so bad we know best. Tonight, my hope is to introduce you to a few of these unbelievable drawings and sketches and how they relate to the murals. In order to do that, I want to take a step back to that first epiphany I had with Max Ovenka so many years ago, about 14 years ago. I had just moved back to Pittsburgh from Chicago and was writing my dissertation on Chicago's public murals, actually historic murals from the early 30s. Spent years trudging through schools to see what amounted to over 2,000 mural panels from the 1930s. When I got back to Pittsburgh, somebody said to me, oh, you should check out these murals at this church. They're quirky, they're interesting. And I thought to myself, ah, I've seen them all. This isn't going to be any different. And they mentioned where the church was. And I remember passing it along Route 28. And I thought, OK, well, I'll check it out. I've been to lots of different sites to see murals. And I want to see this. At that time, there were no public docent tours. There was not the exposure that the murals have, have today. 
So I went to Sunday Mass in order to visit these murals. I was raised Catholic, so I was very familiar not only with murals, but also the tradition of mural painting in churches. I walked in and like many of you, was astounded. This is a full church from a recent tour, but at the, at, on that Sunday, the church was relatively full too with parishioners. I sat in one of the pews and I was beyond words. I listened to the priest, but my mind was on the images on, in the, on, on the walls around me. I saw some images that are very similar to things I've seen in other churches. The Virgin Mary dominating the altar, um, though slightly different with a Croatian flair. I saw a crucifixion scene on the left and a pieta scene on the right of the altar. In some ways, those were expected. It was the unexpected that moved me beyond words. The images of Croatian mothers mourning their dead sons in war. I turned around and I saw the images of immigrant mothers mourning the loss of their sons to industry in the new world. I also saw images like justice and something I rarely saw, injustice, gas masked with a bloodied sword and those glaring eyes, one of the key images that a lot of us think about when we see, think about the, the Vanka murals. I left the church and I couldn't believe what I saw on the exit. The Virgin Mary on the battlefield, Christ bayoneted by soldiers on the battlefield as well. A, a simple peasant meal, an immigrant meal, a Croatian meal, and then the capitalist glaring and absurdly drawn um, and decadent on the wall as I was leaving the church. I left and I was speechless. I thought to myself, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this in a church. I've never seen it in any public space. I've certainly not seen this in Pittsburgh and not something from 1937 of this quality. And these were all murals, 37 and 41. And these are all murals done by a man I had never heard of before that day, Max Ovenka. Of course, when I left the church, I thought to myself, I've got to find out everything I can possibly find out about these murals. And it was interesting, the first feedback, and you're seeing right now on the screen, an image of the artist painting one of the scenes of Mary on the battlefield. And it's a, a man at work, as I've seen many images. I started to ask around and started to research these murals. And what I found is that there was a lot of legend around it, particularly about how isolated Vanka was in the process. What you're seeing is a quote from Louis Adamich in My America, who was a friend of Vanka's, but also his de facto publicist in a way. He wrote in his book, My America, we were informed that except on Sundays, he, and of course Vanka that means, had worked every day under great creative tension from nine in the forenoon till two or three the next morning and had slept very little when not painting and eaten rather less than a sparrow, but drunk much coffee. This was part of the legend surrounding Vanka was that he holed up in this church in two different periods for about six to eight weeks in 37 and again around the same amount of time in 41 to complete this massive mural cycle. And part of the legend was really that he was accompanied by no one, that he came into this church, an immigrant to this country and created this powerful, um, this powerful program accompanied again only by Father Albert Jagar who commissioned these murals and a ghost who would visit him on, on occasion. Even Vanka himself perpetuated this um, myth to a certain extent in some of his letters home and some of his other, um, his other press, he would talk about the ghost who accompanied him. The murals and his process acquired a, a mythical status that has lasted. This is a quote from 1972 from Donald Miller in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette where he too says, working from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. every day, he completed the complex commission in two months. Here in the cold early spring, Vanka, shivering alone in a double thickness of clo clothing, mixed his colors and painted the curved ceilings and walls. We get the impression that these murals came out of this, this isolated space where this man created these unbelievable works. And I understand where this legend comes from. As a matter of fact, they are so unbelievable that we have to think of them as something miraculous, created in this kind of miraculous way. 
And I do think they merit that kind of assessment to a certain degree. But I started to wonder, really, was that where they stunned it's so much in isolation? Van Gogh was a trained artist. He was a man who had a great deal of renown in his home country of Croatia, very learned. And when he came to this country in the 1930s, he didn't hold himself up into his studio in New York or even when he was in Pittsburgh. He got out there. He got into the, the fabric of this culture. And I thought to myself, well, how do the Vanka murals fit into the Pittsburgh mural culture? Vanka's murals in Melville were part of a larger Pittsburgh culture of the 1930s and early 40s of really amazing and unique murals. As a matter of fact, when Vanka first arrived here in 1935, and he came here um, with his friend Louis Adamic, but also for an exhibition of his works that he was having at the Wonderly Gallery, Pittsburgh was already immersed in a very radical mural culture. This is a long quote, and I, I'm actually gonna have to read this from a, um, another place because I actually can't see this. I don't see how an artist could exist here in the midst of all of this labor activity and not feel it. If it doesn't touch him, he isn't any more than a hack. The pageantry of many races churning against a background of heavy industry has always been stimulating to my imagination. Without debating the Rotarian bromide that Pittsburgh is the workshop of the world, we must admit that this is a city of working men and adequate interpretation of the city must include them. The city is so rich in dramatic proletarian subject matter and grounded in the customs and cultures of so many lands that there is sure to arise a, great, a really great proletarian art. This is a quote from 1934 by a man named Leland Canock, who was a self-proclaimed artist to the proletariat, but a muralist who was really agitating for the creation of a mural culture that would take into account Pittsburgh's working class, but also Pittsburgh's immigrant class, and really rise up and create something that was different than what was happening around the country, which was a mural renaissance of its own. Knock, as a matter of fact, created his own agitational murals and radical murals in the 1930s. They don't exist, but they are images like this of labor and capital and the Cathedral of Learning on Fire and other radical images that don't survive till today, but they give us an indication of the climate in the 1930s when Vanka was walking around the city. I started to think about, are there other murals that he might have related to? And of course, by the time he arrived here in 35, the Carnegie Museums had one of the best known mural cycles of the early 20th century, John White Alexander's Crowning of Labor. At the Kaufman's department store, just a few blocks away from the gallery that was hosting the Vanka show, um, was a cycle that actually was finished in 1930 by Boardman Robinson in the display floor that showed the history of trade. And it included modern trade and modern commerce, as well as human trade, the slave trade in the early 20th century. All of the, and these were all done with autom uh, automotive paint and hosted an entire um, mural conference around these murals in 1935. In 1935 to 1938, the US Post Office on Grant Street, Federal Courthouse and Co Post Office was just finished and several murals were also completed at around the same time, including Stuyvesant Van Veen's Panorama of Pittsburgh, which you see here is one of Pittsburgh's bridges, but also the Pittsburgh skyline manipulated to look like the hammer and sickle. Um, we also see Howard Cook's steel workers and glass workers, and excuse me, coal miners, in another fresco that was painted in the same building. And another mural in that same building by Kindred McLeary, which shows justice beating down one section of society and raising up the workers on another. And you see the scales of justice off kilter in the foreground. This mural no longer exists either, but all of these murals were being created and the sketches shown in Pittsburgh at this time as Vanka was getting to know the city and this country. Of course, I've never found a direct connect, well, at this point, I haven't found a direct connection between Vanka and these muralists, but I do know that Pittsburgh appealed to him and that he was um, taking it all in. Adamich said, 
For Vanka, Pittsburgh with its great smoking flaming steel mills and its ugliness, which is so honest and intense it almost becomes beauty, excited Maxo even more than New York. When he left Maxo Vanka here, um, he actually said that there was enough material in Pittsburgh for Maxo Vanka to paint for five years. What I have found most interesting recently and in, with the new gift from the Halderman family is that we actually start to be able to see Pittsburgh through his eyes. And I am able now to make more connections between what he was seeing and how he was engaging with the culture of Pittsburgh. I wanna take a moment to look at a little cl more closely at some of the drawings that he was making or creating at this time and where they take us around Pittsburgh. It's been so interesting to me because I feel like with these drawings, we can walk around Pittsburgh with Max Ovanka. We can think about what he might have been looking at and understand his working process a little bit more. I'm gonna go back to his drawing tablet and um, some of the drawings. Some of the buildings here might be familiar to you. What you are seeing here on the right is the Copper Building, Copper's Building downtown and the Gulf Tower. They were relatively new images in 1935 when Max Ovanka drew them. Walking downtown just a few blocks from the federal courthouse, just a few blocks from the um, Allegheny courthouse where another set of murals were, Vanka captured these new modern buildings against this new skyline of Pittsburgh. He also walked to Oakland, just a block away from the Carnegie Museum of Art or the Carnegie Institute at the time, and did several sketches of the Cathedral of Learning. Relatively new too at that time, though a little bit older than the other buildings. And you see the sketch on the left with Alumni Hall on the right. It's a view that's actually not particularly possible, physically possible if you're walking through Oakland, but he has captured both at this moment in this beautiful, highly detailed image. We see this church that some of you might recognize as the Immaculate Heart of Mary on, in Polish Hill. And we know that Vanka took his time to walk through the communities of Polish Hill to capture the churches in other neighborhoods, to really capture not just the majestic um, skyline of that church, but the houses in the foreground, contrasting not just the religious, but the everyday images of the people of Pittsburgh, which captured his attention so much in the murals themselves. We also see the steel mills. He spent a great deal of time in Homestead, in blast furnaces in different parts of Pittsburgh. And um, this is a Johnstone um, image. But we also, many of the, uh, again, part of the legend of Vanka was that at certain points he dressed like a working man in order to get to know the people who were working in these mills. So much so that at one hotel, they tried to throw him out because he looked not like a hotel guest, but just a working man. But that was okay with Maxo. He continued to draw. And what we see here is another vision of him as a draftsperson. Um, Unlike the murals, which are, had to be created in a relatively quick pace on a large scale, with the drawings, I was amazed to see the traces of his hand, the details of shading, of the minutia of the mills, the attention and the care that he gave, in some instances, the people that he saw, in other instances, the buildings, and in here, the machinery. What we start to see in this collection is Vanka as an observer, Vanka as a laborer, artist as laborer, who takes the time to look, to investigate, to draw, and to plot out how this mural cycle will look. This is again an image from the church itself, but along with the drawings and the sketches, what we have seen in this wonderful new collection are preparatory drawings for these murals themselves. Um, seeing how Vanka uses in this case oh, the sketch to plot out the design, to plot out the image itself and the composition. And you can see from the finished image and the original sketch, he makes changes along the way. For me as an art historian, one of the things I love the most is to actually see the process of an artist. I think we all tend to think artists, somehow the artwork miraculously appears. But artists are workers and the artistic process is a set of problem solving decisions. 
And I'm very happy to be able to see this even more clearly in this collection. We see this in other works as well, such as this with Christ on the cross, bayoneted by the soldiers, where Vanka is playing with different facial expressions, different um, compositions before he got, gets to the final solution that we see on the wall. In other places, we see looser sketches in his um, sketchbook. This is the simple family meal, the Croatian meal. And on the left, what you are looking at is a very loose sketch of the family of the composition. But you can see actually in this sketch, he's thinking about the physical space. There's the arch in the doorway. He knows where this is going to go and he's plotting out this image. From these images that I've shown, you also see the range of what this collection shows from these very schematic gestural drawings to highly detailed finished drawings. Um, it gives us a new viewpoint on this artist completely. One really interesting part of this new collection is actually how certain figures in the murals, perhaps some that we haven't looked at very closely, took a lot of this artist's attention. This is a difficult image to see, but this is an Old Testament wall. Um, and what you are seeing is Prudence, Mahdi, and above the Old Testament scenes. And we see that in his sketchbooks, Vanka really worked through the Moses figure several times to get to the final image. This is from the sketchbook. And as you see, uh, the different physical expression of Moses, the hand of God, and then two other workings of the same scene. He really returned time and time again to certain figures to get to that final conception that we all love and are so astounded by. Even in minutia, where throughout the sketchbooks, I was amazed and Anna and I both commented on the fact of his obsession with hands and hand gestures and arms and how those small movements gave so much poetry and so much um, meaning to his works. I was able to go to the church very briefly this week and I hadn't been to the church since I saw this collection. And all I wanted to do was find all the hands in the murals again and to revisit Max Ovanka again with all of these drawings in mind. In fact, that is really what this be is the beginning of. You see Vanka on the left, the finished um, work on the, on the right and his sketchbook behind. The new collection is going to open a new door for us to really rethink how he got to these finished products, but also how he engaged with the city of Pittsburgh. I'm very excited about the possibilities of this new collection as we move forward. Time is very different now than it was in January, but we still hope one day to um, exhibit the works, to share them in the, with the public, to find to use these works as a bridge for collaboration, for partnership, for new thinking. Uh, Vanka created this amazing cycle and these drawings at a time of immense crisis in the United States, the Great Depression. Um, as we are in another moment of monumental crisis, I think it's important for us to return to how important arts, artists are in looking at our society today and envisioning a future. They are essential workers too. And I hope that as we move forward, we can use all of the thinking that Vanka and the Vanka family have given to us to envision a future together and think together. So on that note, I'm eager to hear what you have as questions because again, one of the wonderful things about this medium is that I can hear what you want to know more about. And as I start the research for the next phase of, of this um, wonderful society in the murals, I want to know what others want to know. So please share that in, in the Q&A. And on that note, we're going to open it up. Sylvia, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing all of your expertise. We have one question so far. So folks, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. And that question is from Kate. And she asks, what, happens, what happened to those murals in the Kaufman building? Ah, that's a very good question, Kate. Um, the murals in the Kaufman building, there were several panels and they were um, sold to Colorado Springs where Boardman Robinson taught for many years. 
they are now, right now, I believe in storage, though they have been out for exhibition on some occasions. So they are no longer in Pittsburgh, but I would love one day to imagine uh, a way to bring them back. They were done on canvas. So a lot of times we tend to think of murals as done directly on the walls, but, a lot, but many at that era were done on canvas and could be detached. Thank you. Michael and Diane ask, how was his work received at the time? Uh, he, I guess, Vanka, right? Yes. Okay, so actually, really, I've been looking back to some, this is really, it's been such a wonderful moment to actually um, be able to return to some of the earlier research. And I've been reading newspaper articles from around the country and popular magazines from this time. Um, at the time, I just reread an article that was talking about the fact that the church, and I, and I would love to ask Anna about this, um, produced 24,000 postcards of the murals that sold out immediately. And there was a huge, and again, I haven't, had, I haven't been able to prove this, but there was articles across the country from Idaho and Iowa Falls and other places talking about how um, popular these murals were. So I get, you know, so he was a well-known artist and I think these were definitely, um, considered as as amazing as they're considered today. I actually think, especially because they were at that time, and some of you may know the history of New Deal art patronage in which murals had a renaissance during the 1930s. So the government sponsored the production of murals for post offices. There's one here, for example, at the Squirrel Hill Post Office that some of you may know. But post offices, schools, public buildings throughout the country, but they tended to be very formulaic, by and large, optimistic, historical images, not necessarily controversial. So by the late 1930s and 1940s, there's a bit of a pushback to that kind of mentality. So I think his murals are coming up at a time when um, his kind of incisive insights were needed. And also, you know, they, they grow out of another tradition of really powerful mural painting that we see in other countries like the Mexican muralists. So these two questions have similar themes. So let's try and group them together. Fred and Donna ask, the sketchbook seems to have no sketches of the real people who were models for the murals. Were, they li were there live models for the murals? And then Mo asks, the figures behind the altar, are any of those based on real life people from Vanka's life? I look and wonder if he has painted any friends or family or local residents. So really, uh, you know, questions about kind of um, who are these faces? Did he, are they real people or did they come from, from his uh, imagination? So, um, and Anna, please jump in on this too, because I think you have some um, insight on that. I, um, so the, I didn't show, I should actually mention too, we've only seen the smallest bit of what's in the sketchbooks or in the drawings. So there's much more, there's over 130. Um, some are depictions of people a little bit more closely. And um, there's, a, a, there's the belief that the figure of the Christ figure in the crucifixion was actually a black man from the area. And other people have suggested that some of the people behind the altar and other places were, from, were known people. And Peggy is in two of the murals, Vanka's daughter. I see that from Alex Halderman, hello. And um, there you go. And, and Anna's saying. I just wanted to, uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I just wanted to uh, mention too that if we're looking at the figures at the bottom area of, if you're thinking of the figures at the bottom of the murals, um, those are not Vanka's paintings at the bottom. They were added later. But if you're look, at, but if we're talking above, um, honestly, I, I'm not positive if those, um, you know, there there are some folks who see relatives in even Vanka's images in terms of people who might have been present in the church when he was there. But um, we don't have a lot of um, detail from Vanka about that. So our next question comes from Lauren, and Lauren asks, is there any particular meaning about the placement of the murals vis-a-vis -vis one another? For example, are certain murals placed next to, one, to others thematically? Um, thank you, Lauren. That's a really good question, too. So I like to spend a lot of times, and I think I may have mentioned the words mural program or mural cycle, 
today because I think a lot of times we forget to think exactly as you're thinking, which is the artist isn't just thinking about the one composition, but he or she thinks about how they relate to one another. So there is a really beautiful dialogue that happens in the church of old world, new world of the immigrant experience. Um, and a lot of point counterpoint that happens. So without a doubt, he is thinking about that as he is placing them in the church. Um, at this point, I'm not sure if we have anything written that says how he was thinking it through, but there's a clear narrative that's happening when you're there and you're walking around. It's interesting, I was saying to Anna, it's actually hard to talk about murals on a screen rather than in a space because they're inherently part of a, a moving space that that asks you to relate to it in that way and i think he very much kept that in mind the next question comes from uh, deborah she asks where else would we find the work of vanka other murals elsewhere other mediums well this was a uh, you know so you're going to see a lot of portraits and paintings of his work um, in croatia as a matter of fact but he worked in a variety of media. And in later life, I found actually to a wonderful yearbook photo um, from a local, I believe, and I, the family might know better, in, in a Bucks County high school that um, dedicated a yearbook to him. And they spoke of his artwork and his contributions to the, to the community. And this was in the 1950s. So he, his work changed, as a matter of fact, too, from portraits, paintings, and then worked in a variety of other media. So um, it, the works are scattered around a bit. Now we have the, the drawings are here in Pittsburgh. The murals are here in Pittsburgh. As far as other murals, I am unaware of other murals. If there's anybody who knows of otherwise, would love to know. The next question comes from Cindy. And Cindy asks, what are the key differences you see between the 1937 and 1941 murals? Oh, that's a Great question. Um, because you see, I, I really see such a, a, and we have to think historically too, a huge difference, number one, and all, such a strong statement in the 1941 murals too, that deals more specifically with um, the oncoming, the war. We're talking about a difference of four years, but those four years were monumental in world history in terms of the escalation of World War II in Europe. Remember his homeland. Um, is there and um, the oncoming war, the entrance of the US into this war. So for me, I see works that are really um, strongly related to issues of, you know, anti-war to a certain extent, to social justice issues, but related to this, this escalation of war. For me, I, I'm a daughter of immigrants and I've, I was really taken with the immigrant narrative that dominates a lot of the images, but when it coalesces with the and with the war imagery or the anti-war imagery and the issues of social justice and industry, I think that's where the magic happens for the Vanka murals. Before the next question, I will add that the uh, the Vanka's family says that there are murals in Croatia. Oh, there are murals in Croatia for Mario. One day I will get to Croatia. <laughs> <I hope. laughs> Um, Julie asks, is there any idea as to how the sketches from the sketchbook will ultimately be displayed? I, you know, I, my sincere hope, and again, this is something I would like to speak to Anna about, our hopes in January, again, which again, seems like a lifetime ago, were to do an exhibition relatively soon or to have these exhibited, to be able to share these. I think the gift, uh, you know, I think we want to do the family proud, but also share in the same, in the same spirit of generosity. Um, and that could be through an exhibition space, an exhibition. I don't know when we're going to be able to do something that's physical. So perhaps there might be something digital to begin and then something physical. So it is the hopes that that will happen. And I am very honored to work as the lead curator on this collection, but that doesn't mean that I will be the only one to work on this because my hopes again are that this will be a bridge or a partnership and that there might be collaborations that bring these to light in different ways, educational ed um, exhibits and so forth. So I wanna jump back, I'm catching up on the chat here. Um, Rhonda mentions uh, to the question about the reaction from before that some of the elders of the church told the conservators, 
that when they were children, they were actually afraid of the more graphic figures. So that gives us sort of a sense of, of reaction from churchgoers. You know, I, I think that's the other thing to really, I, I feel that it's going to be really interesting to hear more and more from the community. I think it's great. I see Rhonda. There. Hi, Rhonda. I recognize so many of the names. It's nice to see you. The conservators are in, and thanks to the conservators for bringing these to light, and thanks to the lighting people from Clear Story to help us see this even more. Um, they get that wonderful uh, ability to interact with everybody in the church as well and hear stories like that. So I could imagine, sure, when you're little that some of these images might be a little bit scary or comforting. It's really, it depends. It depends. If you grow up with it, I could also see it being a huge comfort. Brittany asks, you've spoken about the Croatian features. Will you explain what makes the Vanka features distinct? Oh, I'm sorry. I, if I said features, I, I, I made a mistake there. I meant actually if, not physical features, but I meant um, some of the symbolism and some of the images. So for example, some of the textiles worn by um, Mary, the queen in the central over the, the apse altar, or the images of the Croatian mothers mourning their sons, and some of the also the, the symbolic images throughout the church. Um, an art historian named Heidi Cook did a lot of wonderful research thinking about how Vanka, from his work in Croatia, created a pan-Croatian set of images in this church, drawing from different communities in Croatia to build a narrative that would appeal to a, a heterogeneous Croatian audience in the United States. So there are certain details in the clothing, certain details in the flowers, um, throughout that, that bring out the Croatian identity. Got time for a couple more questions. Sue asks, can you comment on the Vanka murals in regard to the Diego Rivera murals in the Detroit Institute of Arts? Oh, well, that's a, I, I love the Detroit Institute. I love Diego Rivera. And um, those were done in 1934 and they were definitely in the news as well as his Rockefeller Center murals. Um, in the 1930s, so artists around the world, but particularly in the United States, were very aware of those murals. And the Des Detroit industry murals show workers um, in, an, in the automotive industry in, fr in true fresco. So um, I think there, this is, I, I, I believe there's a lot of crossover with a lot of Mexican murals of that generation. Um, I work with somebody at Pitt who is a Latin American specialist, Jennifer Jostin, and she and I once spoke about um, the connections between Mexican muralism and Vanka, and that that's an area to still, that's, that's left to be explored. And we actually brought in another Mexican art historian who also looked at particularly the capitalist and said, I see this, I see the Mexican murals in this and the peasant family. So I think there, that's another area that deserves a little bit more attention, but it's a good eye to see that connection for sure. He was also aware of Orozco and they knew each other. And Orozco was one of the three, Los Tres Grandes, the three big ones of the, that's a, a chat from coming in from Alex Halderman. And Orozco happens to be my favorite of the three Mexican muralists. He, and he was in the United States at the time doing murals in Dartmouth. And um, that actually had the same kind of point counterpoint narrative, uh, historical narrative. So um, it's a very, I, I would love to hear more about that connection with Orozco. He was a, a master painter for sure. This one might be for Anna. Um, someone asks if you can speak to the history of the Society to Preserve the Murals of Max Ovanka. Did the murals always hold this public attention or were they forgotten and then brought back into the public eye? So the, um, the uh, sorry, um, I assume you can hear me. <laughs> the, um, the, the, sorry about that. Um, no, the mural, so the mural, the society was formed in 1991 and it was, it did come out um, of a partnership, sort of a partnership with, um, with the, uh, with the congregation. It's really a, um, a uh, recognition of the fact that after since 41 that really their their condition was becoming a concern and there was some renewed interest 
1991, the society formed because they wanted to be able to create public opportunities for public investment support and, and to raise awareness about them. It really wasn't until um, uh, I would say there was a, a presentation of Gift to America, which was in 2008, when during a Pittsburgh anniversary, that I believe um, there was four sold out shows of that play. And I think at that moment, the, the society felt that they, that they had an opportunity to capitalize on people discovering the murals for the first time. So it really has been since, really since 2010, when we, um, since 2010, when we started to do more, uh, recruit more volunteers and do more structured tours, that uh, now we are up to having about 4,000 people plus each year come for tours. And we are, um, you know, just seeing unprecedented levels of recognition for the murals at this time. Um, so I think that uh, we're in a new day. Uh, and as Sylvia has said a number of times, we're also at a moment, especially with this collection, where we have the opportunity to really um, have a, another side of the story to tell. And we also have a way, especially with what's happening with, with you know, what's happening in our world today, I think we have a moment when we have the opportunity to really introduce a number of new audiences to the murals and, and, and there's that universal timeless messaging that comes across that um, we think is so important right now. We've got one more question before I turn it over to Anna to introduce some special guests. Uh, we have a lot more questions actually in the chat and we're going to do our best to answer them uh, via email when we send out the recap from the event. But we wanted to close on this one from Cindy who asks, how or why do you think these murals resonate with people today? And if they are timeless, why? Is that a question for me? <laughs> I wasn't sure. Yes, go for it. I, uh, well, I can tell you, they. I think they. I think they're resonating even more strongly in this particular moment. I will say that it was one thing I've been thinking about a lot. For me, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, I'm the daughter of immigrants. A lot of us are the children or the grandchildren of of in, immigrants, and the stories that I grew up with of the old world, our family there, and the new world, and me witnessing the struggles of my parents in this environment, and thinking about the current situation for immigrants, and how many people, like my family, live between two cultures, and, and really struggle sometimes in this country. Um, it's, it's really very moving for me to have seen that, and, and in that regard, it was a solace to see that writ large on the walls of a church, which it was for, again, in my family was a place for congregation and community and bringing people together. For me too, the issues of social justice that come out on the walls are things that are still so important to me, to others, and in moments like the one we're in now are even more important. Um, I think I can speak for, and I think I'm not that different than a lot of other people. So I think that's where they resonate with me. And I think that might be also where they resonate with so many other people. Sylvia, thank you so much. I will turn it back over to Anna to introduce some special guests. I just wanna say thank you to everyone again. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And of course, um, you know, we'll keep, uh, we'll keep talking. So there's, <laughs> there's the, so we have a few more minutes, but I am um, going to, in just a minute, I'm going to unmute Maria Halderman, who is on with us today and has been answering some of your questions um, along the way. And um, Maria is Moxovanka's granddaughter. She um, is uh, made the gift possible and um, she has been such a help to us helping to tell the story of um, and discovering more history and, and sharing more history. So we really appreciate her partnership. So I am going to um, let okay. her run here. And uh, yeah. Roslyn. 
but it's probably you. you can. Oh, there you are on, Mara. You're on. I am on. Okay, <laughs> I don't see myself. Okay, <laughs> okay sorry. Um, okay. Um, that was an excellent presentation, first of all, I want to say. And the other thing I wanted to say that my grandfather really did get a lot of influence from the Mexican muralists. Um, he knew, like I said, he knew Orozco. And, um, and he also tra traveled extensively in Europe and got his background training by looking at all the, the murals in Italy, in all of the churches, um, in Verona, in Padua, in all, almost all the cities, the major artists there, the Renaissance murals. And I think that's where a lot of his strong feelings and figures of the people come from. Um, I wanted to just show you, I know we don't have much time, but to show you some of the murals here, and I'm gonna let Alex, my son, take the computer Thanks. around. Well, we don't have the picture um, what dear? You don't have a picture? I don't think we have a picture at this point. Oh, you don't? You're not getting No, it says video has been disabled. But um, I think that we, um, I think okay. what we'd love to do is, um, I think what we'd really love to do is be able to say that we have um, another installment. Of okay, absolutely. What I saw on the Q&A and in the chat was um, a lot of questions actually, Maria and Alex, about um, the family and um, things that you know, things that only you would know the answer to. So I oh, think I'd love to answer those questions. So I think there's a lot of um, opportunity. I think we need to schedule another <laughs> another table another talk. session. Definitely, yeah. I'd love to do this. And um, so we're just so excited that you were able to be here and just, you know, tremendous thanks, obviously. And I, is there a beautiful job? You is did there a beautiful anything you'd like to say about um, making the gift and, and why you decided to do that? Uh, the time came and I think, Anna, you are a wonderful saleswoman. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't turn you down. You have so many good reasons for wanting to have this as part of, um, as, and to have it all together. I think it's so amazing and just lovely. And um, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, well, okay. Well, well, thank you again. And um, uh, uh, I think, Rosalind, do you want to um, close us up here? Yes, certainly. Thank you all so much. What an absolutely fascinating evening. Um, we will be sharing a recording of the program via email. So in case you came in late, are there things that you want to reflect back on? You'll be able to check that out. If you liked the program, you can come back for another one on June 17th with Jeff Slack. He is researching the history of St. Nicholas. Um, and just wanted to say thank you again to everyone who's donated to this event. If you're interested in supporting more of the work that the society does, you can go to vankamurals.org. Um, and if you are interested in planning some Pittsburgh adventures with my book, you can check it out at 100thingspittsburgh.com. And thank you all so much for allowing me to uh, metaphorically sit with you at your table and have this conversation. And Anna, I will turn it over to you for any uh, last remarks. Thank you all. Thank you, Roslyn. And um, I just want to note that um, one of the reasons we're doing this, obviously, is because we can't be together. And uh, we had scheduled um, a cocktail. Our oops, sorry. Um, Cocktails and Conservation is our uh, usual annual fundraiser, and Rosslyn was our host for this year's um, Cocktails and Conservation, which is currently holding for uh, celebration in November. And so we're hoping November 5th, we will be able to get back together, but if we can't, we'll figure out some creative way to be together. Um, I wanna say thanks so much both to Rosslyn, but especially Sylvia, thank you so much for accepting the um, role as the lead curator of the Vanka collection and, and we're so I think I think as you and I as you said we both sat across the table looking at this and I think uh, more than once got a little bit what you'd say verklempt about everything so it was a wonderful experience and again 
thank you all. I do want to say that we are currently um, starting to plan a return to tours at the church as, and, and really that means we are planning we are planning the reopening. We have not got a date yet for when we can be um, receiving people back in the church. Um, we are following the diocese and we're also following all the guidelines that are out there. But we, are, we will do our best and our wonderful volunteers will, will do their best, um, many of whom are on the call tonight too, I think listening, um, to, to get people back in the church and continue to save and share these murals. And, and the final thing um, that I do wanna say is that this year, despite all of this, is a huge uh, transformative year for us beyond the, the, the in addition to, I would say, the, the gift of the Vanka collection, which is just this an incredible opportunity and, and wonderful gift. We are in the midst of doing um, interpretive plannings for, and, and to decode that a little bit. That's really us finding more ways to tell the story effectively. And this will only add to that storytelling and, and, and the visitor experience at the church. The other thing that we are working on too is um, just continuing to invest in our docent program. So a lot of things will be continuing to develop even though we, you aren't seeing us actively do it, we are working. And we are also planning, um, as Jeff will tell you in June, um, we are creating a historic structure report related to the church, but we're also planning the next phase of conservation and lighting. So we are continuing to move forward and we do that because of all of you. And, and we hope that you'll just keep continuing to, as Rosslyn does, bring everybody who comes to the city to the church to see the murals. There's still a lot of people here who haven't seen them yet. So thank you again. Um, you know, we're, we're happy for any uh, feedback. <laughs> <laughs> that you have for us. Um, we're learning and we'll, we'll just become slightly more experts um, as we go along. Um, Ross and I'm going to say something that we have two raised hands and I'm not sure what we should um, do with that. Um, I guess we should call on them. Uh, Vick, Vicki the Magnificent is first yeah. and then Jen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, although we have to um, allow them to talk. Okay, Vicki, go ahead. You should be able to. Vicki, did you want to say something? Trying to unmute her. Okay, here go. we go. Um, yeah. This was wonderful. My mom just moved from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. I live in Philadelphia, and it was so great to be able to do this remotely. So thank you very much. Terrific. And, and this is, is this Vicki Demers? Is that Vicki? Yes, Demers? yes, yes. So um, I just want to point out that Vicki Demers is the daughter. She's talking about her mom, um, Marlene. Uh, their fa her father, David Demers, uh, wrote Gift to America, and uh, that was first performed in 1981. And uh, really, um, when they put the theatrical lights on the murals, that's when everyone went, hey, wait a second. <laughs> Talk to me about those murals again. So, um, so Vicki and Marlene, I guess. Um, yes, right I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And there was one other hand raised. Yeah, there. we've got Jen. Let me get Jen unmuted here. Okay, Jen, you should be good to go. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it's one question with two bullet with two bullet points. Will you be emailing information about? A, the next um, table talk, because this is amazing and fantastic. Um, I'm a Polish girl uh, and uh, from Pittsburgh, so he basically pressed all my buttons. And the second is, will it also include inf further information about cocktails and conservation? Yes, absolutely. We will right be- on. We will be sharing. Um, we will be sharing a recording of this session. We'll try to answer some of the questions we didn't get a chance to answer um, on this um, at this moment, and we will definitely give you all kinds of information about cocktails and conservation. So, my last question, and I can certainly email this, is: Are you open to further journalism about this? Because I happen to be a freelance journalist who actually lives about three hours outside of Pittsburgh right now but would be happy to do pieces on this that would send more people when they come into the city to visit. Uh, and okay. if that's true, can I ask someone to email me some contact information? Absolutely. Um, um, yes. I, would, I would be the person um, that to talk to and um, we will get you connected. So thanks right very much. Thank you.
That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. I think um, I think that's it. I think we're thank you very much for staying with us, and um, we're glad you enjoyed it. And we'll see you in June. And Maria, I will be talking to you about um, a Vanka family um, tour, maybe tour of the <laughs> of, of the uh, Vanka oh, home. There's so much here to see. <laughs> <laughs>